Okay, so um, I am going to be talking today about uh, our surveys with the Wisconsin DNR um, surveying for ornate box turtles with spaniels. Um, this is a super fun project. Um, I always have to be careful when I'm telling people I'm doing this work and I'm like, you know, try to tell them this is such a fun project. I have so much fun doing this. And they're like, oh yeah. And then I kind of feel like they think I'm not, it's too fun or something. I'm like, well, wait, we're getting a ton of data on this species too. So it's a great project. We get a lot of information. It's very scientifically based, but who doesn't like working with dogs? So it's a really fun project. Um, I have quite a few slides today, um, lots of pictures, just because I think that's <clears throat> one of the best ways to show this. So I'll go through things um, fairly quickly, but yes, like Tim said, please let me know if you have questions. Um, if we don't have time for them, feel free to um, <clears throat> email me afterwards too. I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, really quick overview of the presentation today. I wanted to go through a little bit of background on um, the box turtle itself, some of the threats, the survey methods we use, just briefly results and next steps. Um, I'm hoping video will work. I have a three minute video um, that our video folks at the DNR put together on turtle dog, on the turtle dog surveys. Um, and then just briefly, the Wisconsin Turtle Conservation Program, um, which is a volunteer citizen-based monitoring program <clears throat> um, to locate um, problem road crossings in Wisconsin that we encourage people to get involved in. So the ornate box turtle, as you can see uh, from the person holding this turtle here, um, that's a full grown turtle, an old turtle. They're, they have a maximum size of four to five inches in length. They are a terrestrial turtle and they're not in the tortoise family per se, um, but that's probably the best way to think of them. Um, they rarely go to the water. Um, sometimes in the midsummer, they're kind of in shallow or should say um, shaded areas, maybe where there's a bit of shallow standing water, um, they will kind of go there to cool off, but um, they generally do not use water habitats at all. <clears throat> uh, generally pretty open habitats. Um, if you're thinking, you know, if you think of like any kind of sand prairie, sand blow areas, um, loop and carner habitat, if you're familiar with that, that's exactly the kind of habitat that this species uses. And they are almost always associated with deep sand deposits. So typically along the Wisconsin River um, and then any other big or moderate sized rivers. And one of the reasons for this is because they need to, most of our aquatic turtles will, or I should say all of our aquatic turtles will overwinter, um, spend the winter in streams, rivers, lakes at the bottom. Um, they stay in the water that doesn't freeze. And because this is a terrestrial turtle, they um, are not, that is not how they spend the winter. These guys need to have um, soil that they can dig in easily. And they actually dig themselves underground and go below the frost line. So they may kind of dig down a little bit, kind of keep moving with the frost line. Some of them probably go down three or four feet to begin with and just stay there all winter. Um, but they need, that's another reason they need really sandy soils is that they need to be able to easily dig to, to keep themselves safe in the winter. And diet, um, pretty much mostly invertebrates. Um, that's the highest source of protein for them and easy to catch grasshoppers, worms, anything they can find. But they also do eat a significant amount of berries, um, succulent vegetation. I've seen one eating mushrooms one time, that, that orange mushroom uh, juice all over its face. Um, and there's been one or two cases of them scavenging um, on roadkill as well. So pretty opportunistic feeders. So the male and female here, um, they are, there's quite a few differences between them. We always have a few that were kind of, kind of, that are kind of hard to tell apart, but these are the really obvious examples. Um, the males are always more brightly colored. And this is, this male is the brightest colored <laughs> ornate I have ever seen. Um, but they'll have um, like his, his front legs have that red on them. His head is yellow. Um, the shell can be orange. 
Um, one of the big things is those bright red eyes. The males always have that. Um, the female, the angle on this is a little off, but you can kind of see her eye. It's just kind of like a brownish, yellowish color. Her shell is just normal colored. There's no um, tinging of orange. And then her front arms are mostly just kind of a yellowish brown. They're not as bright colored. And then her head as well. Um, so for this species of turtle, that's we typically look at the, the head mostly. Um, they do have the same um, sex characteristics as most other turtles where the um, plastron is concave in the male, the male's tail is longer, um, but usually the best method for telling them apart um, uh, is looking at the coloring. Uh, just briefly, primary threats to the species, as you could probably imagine with really open sand prairie habitat, um, barrens, I should have mentioned, barrens and savannah are good habitat for the species. Natural succession is one of the biggest issues that we have for the ornate, just, you know, the land getting encroached, getting taken over by taller vegetation. Uh, luckily, we um, at the DNR, scientists anywhere, can do management for that piece. Um, the portions we can't deal with as easily are just general land alteration, habitat fragmentation, um, you know, of course for turtles, road mortality is a big issue. And for this species, they're cute, um, they're small, they're easy to keep as pets, so unfortunately collection and poaching is an issue for this species as well. Uh, status of the ornate in Wisconsin, um, you can see here the counties where we've um, had e have either current or historic records, so really associated with the lower Wisconsin River um, and some of the other smaller rivers in the south central part of the state. We have 34 records, um, historic records or current records we've ever had in Wisconsin for different sites. So this is not 34 turtles, but 34 sites. <clears throat> um, and of those, we believe we have about 11 remaining populations in the state. Um, and because of that and the continuing threat to the habitat, um, the ornate was listed on our very first endangered species list in 1972 and has been there ever since. So, like I said, these surveys are fun, but we do have scientific objectives for doing these surveys. So our primary goal is looking at the presence, absence, um, looking at presence or absence of ornate box turtles at um, our current sites, and then also visiting a lot of our historic sites. And for the sites where we do find turtles, um, we wanna collect abundance data. So we have an idea of population size at those sites. And then we have about three primary sites that are slightly larger populations, and we're trying to collect better, more precise population data at those sites. So we have a mark recapture program um, going on there. We're marking and um, recapturing all the turtles that we find. So getting into the fun part of this, um, survey methods. <clears throat> um, we are doing visual encounter surveys and you can easily do RNA box turtle surveys um, with people um, and they're fun to do, but they're not overly effective. You can imagine if we have a tiny, tiny little turtle, um, and especially, you know, after a few weeks into the growing season when the grasses get really grown up, they can be really, really difficult um, to find. So, um, you know, obviously as humans, we're only using our eyes when we're trying to do surveys. And dogs, conservation dogs have been, I'm sure you guys have, have heard of these. I know there's a, quite a bit of work in the Milwaukee area that's been, been done with conservation dogs. And it's, they're getting to be used more and more and they're such an efficient tool to do surveys. Um, we've actually been working, um, one of the first people that started doing this is a man named John Lucker. Um, he used to be based out of North Carolina, um, Tennessee area, he's in Montana now. And we've been working with him for 10 years. So, um, which is one of the reasons we don't use the Midwest conservation dogs is we had started with John before they even um, had formed. So, um, but they do very similar work um, and we um, definitely recommended them. Um, and if we were to do another, uh, another type of survey, we would go with them as well. <clears throat> um, so surveys typically conducted in early March to mid-May. 
Um, best temperatures for the ornates when they're active are about 55, maybe 60 degrees up to about 80. Once it gets warmer than 80, they're starting to get too warm or just they're warm enough and so they find shade or go underground. Um, the other thing I should mention about these dogs is they are trained specifically on turtles, um, whereas a lot of the other conservation um, dogs, you can train them on different scents and these guys are just turtle dogs. Um, and as you saw in the first photo, they are retrievers. Um, so a lot of some, I shouldn't say a lot, but some conservation dogs are pointers. Uh, these guys are retrievers. And John trains his dogs um, <clears throat> when they're puppies and he's starting to figure out who in the new litter is a good dog. Um, he'll train them with water balloons. Um, and I don't know if this is, these are bird dogs typically. So I don't know if that's a bird dog thing or if it's specifically for turtles, but he trains them on that so that if they pop the balloon, they know they're biting too hard. So they need to have soft mouths when they're doing the work. So that is a little bit of background um, on how we do the surveys. And then I kind of just wanted to walk through um, with some photos here showing you how we do the surveys. Um, so these are the Boykin Spaniels. They're pretty, they're pretty tiny. As John would say, they're terrible watchdogs. <laughs> um, they are the friendliest dogs. When they find a turtle and they bring it back to us, all they want is just praise and their tail is wagging. And um, they're pretty, uh, pretty cute little dogs. Um, he has, I think he has, I think we were running six this day. You can see five in the photos here. Um, he'll run up to six at a time if we're in a small site or close to a highway and he really needs to keep an eye on the dogs. Um, we may only run two or three, um, but I'd say generally four or five is, is our, our uh, average standard amount. Um, <clears throat> so this is a pretty typical picture for us. We um, have the dogs on those leashes till we get started. He usually waters them down to keep them cool, make, kind of makes them get a huge drink before they go. Um, and then John is with the dogs. He's giving, it's, it's fun to see, he's giving commands to the dogs. Um, they're constantly looking or listening for him. Um, and our job is to stay behind John because we don't want, um, <clears throat> the turtles can get a little off if they smell our scent ahead of them. So we always try to stay, um, stay behind John while he's walking. Um, the dogs are pretty funny. These are three dogs that are, um, they're pretty competitive. These are three dogs that were on the scent of a turtle. Um, and so they kind of, you can see the one on the left there has its nose down. Um, the one on the right had stopped to look up. Um, they're <laughs> so competitive. They'll kind of all be wandering around following the turtle trail and kind of be checking on each other to see if anyone else got it yet. Did you get it? Did you get it? Because they always, of course, want to be the first one um, to get it. And I should mention that, so the dogs are, um, they're trying to, you know, they're obviously smelling for the turtle itself. Um, but a lot of what they are smelling for, and I didn't realize this until I started doing turtle dogs, is that they are, the turtles actually put down a scent trail when they walk. And so that's a lot of what the turtles are, act, or the dogs, excuse me, are actually looking for. Um, so they're actually trying to find that scent trail. And that's why you'll see the dogs kind of just following in a crazy pattern. It looks like that they're actually following where the turtle had walked that morning. So our best survey days are not, you know, hot days where the turtle has just come out or cold days, I should say, you know, either one where they've just come out. It's, you know, kind of moderate days where the turtle's probably been wandering around for a few hours looking for insects. Um, and it's pretty cool to kind of see the, where the turtle has gone um, for the last couple hours by just following where the dogs, dogs take the sun trail. So we do have quite a few people, humans, that go out as well. Um, the dogs are our primary method of finding the turtles, um, but we have people with for several reasons. Um, one, we always do find a few turtles um, when we're out. Generally, maybe 10% of the total catch. Um, 
Our best day, I think at one of our sites, we found 22 turtles in about an hour and a half. Um, and the dogs found 20 and the humans found two. Um, but that's a pretty amazing day to have um, 22 turtles in an hour and a half. Like if that had just been humans looking, we probably would have had like three maybe. Um, so yeah, super efficient. They're just, yeah, so efficient and it allows us to collect so much data. Um, the other reason we need a lot of people out here, aside from looking for the turtles, is every time we find a turtle, um, generally what we do is we collect them, bring them back to the vehicles, and then do um, weighing, measuring on the turtles, and then we put them back. And because they're turtles, of course, and they can't walk very fast and very far, um, we want to make sure we get, every time a turtle is caught by the dogs, we want to make sure we get a really precise GPS location from where it was found, um, partly so we have that data, those data, and partly so we can bring the turtle back there an hour or two later and make sure it's in the exact same spot. Then we need to mark the turtle if it doesn't have a mark on it already, put flagging up, make sure we know exactly where, where the turtle was and who was there. So when the dogs find a turtle, they're so proud of themselves, they'll run back once in a while, they'll bring it to one of us, which is always fun. Um, if we're really close by, but generally they're looking for John um, to show him what they found and get the praise. And he said they can kind of tell like the one that, you know, whatever one had the best day and got the most turtles. He's like, they kind of know at the end of the day that, that they had a really good day and they're pretty proud of themselves. So um, yeah, so this is a pretty typical pose. They'll bring it over, just lightly hold it in their mouth. Um, the box turtle, I should say too, is named a box turtle for those of you that aren't familiar with them because on their bottom shell, they have a hinge. So they actually can close up the bottom part of their shell to touch the top. So they can really get their head and their arms and legs and their tail completely inside their shell. Um, so that's generally when the dogs grab them or even if a person grabs them, they get scared, they don't know what's going on, and they'll completely close up their shell. So you can see here, there's no arms or legs hanging out. I'm sure this one is totally tucked in its shell. Um, we had a dog one time that at one of our sites, um, we had been at the site two days in a row, and it was the second day, and the dog was on, dogs were on a turtle. They grabbed one, and we were watching because we can kind of tell when John says they get birdie, and they're, you can tell they're kind of on a scent trail. And the dog got the turtle and was running back to us with the turtle. And this time the turtle, all its head and its arms and legs were outside of its shell, just kind of flopping around. And we were like, what is that? What is that turtle doing? He's like, you know, why? It's not a normal reaction, right? Like you think they're probably afraid they're getting picked up by a coyote. They're going to tuck themselves back in. And at first we were wondering if the turtle was okay. And then when we brought it back, when, when the dog got it to us and we looked at it, we were like, oh, this it was a turtle we had caught the day before. <laughs> so we think the turtle, it was totally fine. We think it was just so used to it. It was like, oh, I'm getting caught by these dogs again. Okay, I'll just, maybe I'll just watch and enjoy the, enjoy the ride this time. So he was totally fine, but I think he was used to it. Had probably gotten picked up several times before and twice in two days and he definitely was not as scared, but generally they're like this where they're totally tucked in. Um, and about the age of, when the turtles reach about the age of three or four, maybe five, um, their shell gets really, really hard. Um, so the little hatchlings have a bigger risk of predation, but once they get to be older, their, their shells are really, really tough, so. Um, one of the things we're looking for when we're out um, are these, um, people have different names for them. Divots are typically what I call them or forms. Um, they're kind of little, this is where the turtles spend the night. Um, so they'll dig in kind of sideways. Um, and this is a good indication for us that there's turtles at the site, even if we haven't found any yet. If we're seeing these divots, um, you can kind of stick your hand in and it, this only goes in like two or three inches. So it's not like a small mammal burrow where it would keep going into a tunnel system. And it's perfect size for a turtle. Um, this was one we had found. I don't know how my coworker saw this, but this is a lot of times they'll get really far in there, barely even see them. Um, 
And so this is an indication that, um, I mean, or I should say, so this is an indication he's still under for the night. This was early in the day. Um, but you can imagine for humans trying to do this visually, looking at this little piece of exposed shell, we hadn't touched this at all. This is exactly how we found it. Um, it would be nearly impossible. I mean, you could literally be on your hands and knees looking for this. Um, but for a turtle that can smell, you know, this is not too big of a deal for it to find a turtle like this. So really effective, efficient way for us to do, to do surveys and to, to get data on the turtles. Rory, we have one question really yeah, uh, kind of related to the, and maybe you're getting to this related to the uh, turtle that was flopping around because you had caught it the next, the earlier, the day before. How do yeah. you tag the turtles? How did you know that it was a, um, a previously caught turtle? Yeah, good question. No, I don't go into it too much. So um, historically for turtles, what people have done a lot, which some of you may be familiar with is notching. Um, using um, the outer scoots of the turtle shell, um, putting notch marks, and that corresponds to different numbers, um, like in the tens, hundreds, and it gets to be complicated because you have to kind of calculate out what number is what, like this is a 10, this, so this is 10, 20, 30, this is 100, 200, 300, and people use different systems, and the people mix up their own systems. Um, so we've actually started, we work quite a bit with um, Dr. Matt Allender in Illinois. He's at the University of Illinois, and he's one of the leading experts on um, ornate box turtles and eastern box turtles, but he's a veterinarian. So um, very up on, you know, humane methods for turtles, safe methods for turtles, disinfection protocols for turtles. Um, and so he actually... Um, we got our marking system from him. Um, he takes a small Dremel bit um, and actually puts a number on their bottom shell, their plastron, um, which is so much easier. That can get chipped a little bit, but so much easier just to pick up a turtle and you see number 52, <laughs> and it's right there. Um, and the turtle's shell is, you know, you'd have to go pretty far into the shell for the turtle to feel it. Um, we liken it to is getting your teeth cleaned at the dentist where you can, you know, kind of feel the vibration and you can feel that they're, you know, poking, scraping, whatever at your teeth. Um, but it it's not a painful sensation. Um, and I think the notching and also the dremeling is pretty similar where they can feel it, you know, but it's, it's not hitting any nerves. It's not a painful, painful experience for them. Um, and actually the dremeling goes less deep into the shell than the, no than the notching does. So, um, yeah, so we put, put little numbers, they're probably about a half an inch big, um, on the bottom of all the shells. Thanks. And then really quickly, the same uh, question was, uh, how, how long can they live? Oh, these guys, um, probably 40 to 60 years in the wild. Um, they have, you can kind of see on this guy a little bit, but each of their, their top, each of their shells, their top shell and their bottom shell, their top shell is their carapace. And that's made up of like 12 different smaller plates. Um, and you kind of see here, there's actually like little growth rings on the plates, just um, like a tree, um, tree would have for growth rings. Um, and we can age them pretty well until about age 20. Um, and after age 20, their growth rings get so small, they're not growing that much, they get really hard. So um, many, many, many of these live to over 20. We can count them to 20, 25 sometimes. Um, but yes, in the wild, probably about 40 to 60 is a, is a average lifespan. Thank you. Yeah. And I guess I should say too, we've had turtles we found that, you know, have old, old scars. We know there was a, at one of our sites, there was an old farm there. Um, and we find turtles that have, you know, scars from the farm and the farm hasn't been there for 20 or 30 years. So, um, yeah, so they live quite a long time. Um, another example, um, this was a, just a, let's see, it looks like it's maybe about a four-year-old turtle, um, pretty tiny, you know, we would never have found that, the dogs led us to this area, we would never have found that under that duff all by itself, so um, the dogs are just amazing at helping us get better numbers um, on populations. So this is where the, the humans come in. Um, you can see we have, so this was turtle number four and she 
she, I think it looks, maybe it's a he, um, did not have a number yet on the drum, on the, excuse me, on the plastron. Um, so if they don't have a number yet, we know what our next number in our marking system is. This was obviously our first year of doing this. If we were on number four um, at this site, we're on, I think, number 102 right now. Um, so we put the, um, put a number on them. If they don't already have one, that's, we take it back to the vehicle, do the workup. It will get number four dremeled onto it. Um, and then it gets a piece of flagging with number four. So we know exactly where to put it. Um, and then collect GPS location as well, which is good for us, like I said, to get it out, but also good um, habitat information for us. Um, before I get on to marking, just a couple other incidental species. It's one of the things I like, I'm sure Tim likes about doing field work too, is, you know, even if you're looking for one species in particular, you, you know, we all like environmental work and it's fun to get to see everything else that's out. So there's a lot of other cool stuff that we get to see. Um, a lot of these sites are, are prickly pear cactus sites um, in the southeastern part of the state. Um, so it's always still exciting for me to get to see prickly pear um, when I'm working out, um, out in the field. Uh, I'll just go through these pretty quickly, but prairie smoke is usually about in bloom or about to bloom when we do these surveys. Uh, spiderwort, lupin, um, we see a lot of that at our site, our sites. Um, once in a while, we'll find a blanding turtle, which is pretty exciting. Um, snakes, this was a bull snake um, that we found. We've also seen bull snakes mating when we've been out, which is pretty awesome to see in the spring. Um, this was a plains garter snake um, that we found at one of our sites. Um, and amazingly gorgeous to me, um, maybe not for people that don't like snakes, but hognose snake, um, super brightly colored. Um, we see these fairly often. This is definitely a hognose habitat that we're finding them in, finding the, the turtles in. Uh, North American or blue racer. These are pretty rare snakes. So these are always, always exciting to see. Fox snakes. Um, these are, we'll find these sometimes, sometimes juveniles. Um, we see frogs too, a little chorus frog here, leopard frogs. Um, these are, this is a slender glass lizard, which is also endangered in Wisconsin. Um, these co-occur um, quite a bit at sites. So these of course are legless lizard in Wisconsin. You can see it doesn't have any legs. Um, really cool, cool animal that we get to see once in a while when we're doing box turtle surveys as well. Um, this was a hatchling glass lizard, super tiny little guy. You probably hatched the last summer and this was a spring survey. Um, so yeah, lots of other cool stuff, tons of birds that we see. Um, I'm not great with my birds, but um, getting better. Uh, we were out this year. Um, we had uh, yellow-billed cuckoos out at a couple of our sites that we could hear. So um, yeah, just really interesting to see what else is out there. So processing, um, kind of what you'd expect. Um, we generally don't do a lot with the turtles, but we do get weights on all of them, which you can see with the pillowcase here. There's a turtle in the bag. Um, and we are, we do some general measurements, um, get photos of all the turtles. Even if we've seen them before, we get a photo, the carapace, the top shell, the plaster on the bottom shell. Um, and I should mention too, there's, there's been a lot of advances in um, detection software that can uniquely identify animals based on their pattern. So that is our backup method for these guys as well. That's why we always try to get really good shell photos because the patterning on these turtles, on their shells is unique and they can be identified to individual that way. Um, it's not quite at the level where we would feel comfortable or where, we're, where it would be efficient for us to do that for all of our turtles. Um, there's not portable software that we can just take a picture and look at it, you know, have it figured out that quickly. So we're still doing the dremeling for now. Um, but um, yeah, we definitely want good photos so we can um, ID animals. 
Um, and we don't Dremel, I should say, if they're small, if it's a small turtle, even a sub-adult, we don't put Dremel, we don't put Dremel marks on them. Um, so we are um, uh, getting photos for that purpose too. And then we can kind of keep following the turtles um, and we'll compare them when we get back to the office with our un undremeled turtles and see if we can make a match with any of the older turtles. So, um, yeah, I think that was it. One thing I was just gonna mention too, um, with Matt Allender, the veterinarian in Illinois, um, he's been really helpful in um, helping us with disinfection protocols um, when we do these surveys. And there aren't any diseases we can really get from the turtles. You know, you hear about salmonella, of course, there's always what I would call minor bacterial things you can get. You just wash your hands, you know, before um, you'd eat after you handle the turtles. But salmonella is much more common in the pet trade rather than in wild turtles. Um, so they all probably have a low level of it that they're carrying. Um, but not a, not a high amount. But there are a lot of emerging diseases that turtles can pass to each other. So we previously didn't worry about disinfecting materials between sites, or we would do it between sites, but not within a site. Um, and people are, the scientific community is getting even more concerned about that. So um, these are photos from a few years ago, and actually photos from this year would look pretty similar. Um, except that we um, have different bags we use. No turtle touches the same bag. We take everything home at night, bleach it. Um, and then between each turtle, we're either wearing gloves when we do it or using Purell hand sanitizer in between turtles, which of course with COVID, all of us are plenty familiar with hand sanitizer. So um, we're just trying to be careful to make sure the turtles are as safe as possible and they don't catch anything from each other. So this is a male, I believe, based on the red eyes. Um, this is after all the work. We typically hold them for an hour and a half, two and a half hours at most if they're caught right at the beginning. We do the workup and then we take all of them back out. So this is a turtle we're taking back out, um, dropping it off, um, and it is going back. As you can see, we placed it right where the flag was, um, so it goes back to where it was. And we always think it, they're probably think they had some alien abduction for a few hours and then they're all of a sudden back exactly where they were before. So um, yeah, fun day, um, great, great surveys. They're just, they're fun to do. We get collect a lot of information um, and it, it really is, is good for the conservation of the species. Uh, a little bit on results. So we've had, to, this year was our 10th year of surveys. Um, we visited over 25 sites um, with the dogs. And we have 11 confirmed sites in Wisconsin now. Um, one of these was reported, and I'll talk just briefly at the end about the turtle conservation program. Um, but you can report turtle crossings on the roads I had mentioned briefly earlier. Um, and one of our newer, I'm sure they've, I know they've always been there, but um, newer sites was reported to us last year by a citizen who saw a turtle crossing a road, got out, took pictures, sent it to us, and it was an ornate box turtle in Grant County, which is, we don't really have many sites there. So um, citizen reports can be huge for us. Um, and then we're doing the mark recapture. We're continuing that at three sites. Um, we've had John here pretty much every year, 2020. Um, we were not doing surveys. Um, by the fall of 2020, we were able to get out and do some human surveys. Um, and we usually try to get out for a day or two and do human only surveys in addition to turtle dogs, just to keep increasing our numbers as much as we can at the sites. Um, so, you know, we found a couple things that, good news and bad news. Um, you know, the bad news were, was kind of what we were expecting, that many of the historic sites um, that we thought were historic were probably actually historic and likely don't have ornates at them anymore. Um, natural succession, as I mentioned in the beginning, is a huge, um, huge issue for us. And I think at a lot of these sites, it's just, you know, there's unfortunately not management happening at every site or at least to the level that the turtles would need. Um, I should say there is at our primary sites, um, but at some of these sites where we had one turtle spotted in 1950, you know, that's 
of course, not going to be quite as high of a priority as a site where we have 150 turtles, you know, and we found some two weeks ago. Um, and that's, you know, in a perfect world, yes, we'd be doing management at all of these sites. Um, but competing management is an issue for us too, where, you know, the bird people think it should be a closed canopy habitat, um, you know, and that, that's historically what it was. Uh, grass and bird people and the hurt people probably think it should be more open. Um, so a lot of these, you know, DNR has thousands of properties and we unfortunately just can't manage all of them. So we have to focus our efforts um, and some of these smaller pop populations, um, likely natural succession has been an issue. Um, so, you know, there's probably a few sites beyond those 11. We think there's probably 15 sites or less um, for amphibians or reptiles. 50 is generally the magic number for population size to be genetically viable. Um, we're thinking we have maybe three or four genetically viable sites in Wisconsin. Um, but the good news um, from our turtle dog surveys is that the population size at our Rock County site was much larger than we expected. Um, we're still catching, um, <clears throat> still catching new turtles there that haven't been marked, which is a good sign. It means the population is, is large and there's still, you know, we haven't, we don't know the full population size. So, <clears throat> excuse me, we're estimating um, at our Rock County site that the population is probably somewhere between 200 and 300, which is, is pretty, pretty awesome for the species. Um, and then we also have several sites with moderate population size um, that are actively mark recapture sites, our primary sites, and those have a lot of ongoing management um, and they likely could support larger populations. Um, Hopefully, as the turtles kind of bounce back and the management has, you know, been going on for a few decades now, that we'll start to see uh, larger populations. Next steps for us are to continue presence absence surveys just to refine the current range in Wisconsin, um, but also to focus on mark recapture and really refine the population sizes at some of these sites. And that's kind of the first step for us is to get these population sizes. Um, which then would go towards long-term monitoring where we could actually monitor um, the population over time to see if it's changing. And then to identify primary threats at each site, whether it's, you know, some of these sites are right near roads, some of them don't have a major road anywhere nearby. Um, you know, looking at the primary threats, is it roads, is it poaching, is it natural succession? And then to try to to find uh, mitigation techniques where we can, um, can hopefully uh, eliminate those threats that are there. Right, and then finally, a, oh, yep, oh, go sorry. ahead. We, we have a few questions, um, but, okay. but the one that, that maybe I'll bring this yep. one up and then go to the rest later. Um, when you say <clears throat> managing a site, what does that entail? Yes, so managing a site. So we have, um, I tend to work more with species and we have land managers as well. And so for the ornate fox turtle, managing a site for that species would be a combination of um, getting out any invasives that are there. Um, spotted knapweed can be a problem at some of our sites in particular. Um, managing also sumac is a big issue at some of our sites. So trying to keep the sumac population under control. Um, and that could be a combination of just hand cutting, um, doing spot herbicide treatment, um, or using fire. Um, so any combination of those techniques, um, just to keep the habitat more open um, and to keep the, the woody vegetation out. And, you know, some of these are barren sites, savanna sites. We want some trees, big oak trees. Uh, we just don't want everything to be, um, to be large. And that's how um, the ornates have evolved was to be in that kind of habitat. Um, we are really careful um, with time of year that we do this work. So like I had mentioned previously, the ornates um, spend the winter underground. So we work very closely with our land managers. Um, so if they're doing any burning, they are never out once the turtles are active. The burns have to be done before the turtles come out. Um, so generally, it's a probably, a, it is a pretty short window. Um, but in March, you know, you can, there's definitely a time, usually March-ish, um, where snow is gone, you know, maybe in the 40s, um, stuff's kind of drying out, but, you know, there may be still a little bit of frost in the ground, um, still cold, 
And that's a perfect time to do burns for these guys. Um, <clears throat> spot treatment and hand cutting isn't as big of an issue if the turtles are out because it's just people walking through the area. Um, but we are careful with the herbicides that are used that they're, they're safe for amphibians and reptiles. Um, and then lastly, examining microhabitat use. We're getting that a little bit with getting those GPS locations, um, but looking at doing some um, radio tracking, radio telemetry um, to look at dispersal distances, home range sizes, just to try to figure out where each of these guys and gals goes in a year. So lots to, lots to learn. Um, okay, hopefully this will work. Um, this is a three minute video. Um, this is John Rucker here. Um, our video audio folks at the DNR had some extra funding one year um, and they offered to do this um, video for us. So they came out, um, <clears throat> came out with us for a day or two, did tons of video, interviewed Andrew and I, um, interviewed John. So yeah, this is a good, Good little clip, hopefully the sound works. Um, Tim, let me know if you guys can't hear it. I'm not hearing any sound if there is no? any right now. I wonder if when in the share screen, is it that click the box that optimizes volume? Under sharing? Like if you stop sharing and then start sharing again, sometimes there's that little box that if you clip this, you have to check the box. Oh, uh, optimize for video clip? No, uh, the, the other one, share sound. Oh, and then share sound? Yeah, yeah, I think. Okay, let's see if this works. Otherwise it's on YouTube too, but okay. I did see that box, so. Yeah. There we go. Okay. Meet John Rucker. John is hunting in southwestern Wisconsin with his highly trained team of Boykin Spaniels. However, on this beautiful June morning, John is not hunting birds. He is hunting turtles. Specifically, the terrapine ornata, or ornate box turtle. This is an ornate box turtle, a very rare uh, species of land turtle in uh, Wisconsin. It's also classified as endangered. It's endangered because of uh, a bunch of things. There's uh, a lot more increased predation on this species from raccoons, coyotes, possums, skunks. Also uh, habitat fragmentation is, is another big one where these turtles will try and cross roads and they'll get hit um, by vehicles. For over 15 million years, the ornate box turtle has thrived in North America. Sadly, their numbers have started to decline. The ornate box turtle, which we're looking for today, is Wisconsin's only endangered species of turtle in Wisconsin. It's a remnant of the Great Plains and was common throughout the prairies and savannas in the southern part of the state and is now found at just about eight or ten larger sites. So we really want to preserve the species in Wisconsin. John and a team of biologists from the Wisconsin DNR are tracking, marking, and releasing this beautiful endangered species. Together with a group of volunteers and landowners, the team is scouring this prairie with the help of some very special dogs. Back in around uh, 1999, one of my experienced bird dogs just began to bring me eastern box turtles. And then I got a young puppy and uh, it, he mimicked the other dog. And soon I had two high-powered turtle dogs with a large group of high school kids or even college kids. It takes uh, it takes four hours to find one turtle, and this is using very sharp college kids and motivated people looking. The dogs have caught as many as 70 ornate box turtles in one hour in western Illinois one time. Uh, they're just extremely effective. By gaining permission and enlisting local landowners to help, the team hopes to gather valuable knowledge regarding the population of this endangered species. We live right here on this property. This is also one of the third last remaining major areas where the ornate box turtle nests. We've always been nature lovers and like the outdoors and all, but it wasn't until we came out here and it was just a happy circumstance that we moved in here and people said, oh, by the way, you got turtles. Helping the endangered box turtle survive is not only rewarding, it's something everyone can do. If you're interested in learning more or volunteering, visit the DNR website and search turtle. It was not only a good day, it was a challenging day. 
it was very tough conditions for the dogs, but they they didn't quit. I was really proud of them. They uh, it was a tough assignment, and they rose to the occasion and got it done. And I'm a proud papa. <laughs> So John, John's great. He's quite a character. He's fun. Um, it was a little, if that was too quiet, um, that is on YouTube. Um, you should just be able to go to the DNR page um, or even just Google Wisconsin Turtle Dog video if you want to, um, if you couldn't hear it or want to watch it again. Um, but yeah, some of those were good shots of the underside of the turtle too. If you noticed, you could really see how they were closing up their shell. Um, just watching the time here, just uh, two more quick slides um, and then any other questions. Um, but this is the turtle conservation program um, I was mentioning um, or mentioned a couple times. Um, this is our the DNR's biggest um, turtle citizen monitoring program. Um, we started this in 2012, citizen science project, entirely citizen driven. Um, and the objective is to track turtle, um, turtle road crossings and mortality. So they don't just have to be uh, road kills, um, but anytime you see a turtle crossing a road, um, it can be reported to the site. You don't even have to know the species if you're driving. And <laughs> I'm driving sometimes and see a turtle and I can't tell exactly what it is. <clears throat> um, you don't even need to stop. Um, we're really just looking at turtle crossings. So you can just kind of know the general area when you get back home, go online. Um, and locate um, on a map um, the general spot where you were. Um, so we get about 300 reports a year. I think maybe the last couple of years it's been even a little bit more. Um, and you can see from this map here, this was um, the first seven years or so of the survey um, showing where these high crossing areas are. Um, and the goal of this is to allow us to work um, with DOT to find our high crossing areas in the state. Um, and then we have a DOT liaison in our program um, and work with her and with DOT when they're putting new roads in to get underpasses put in um, or turtle culverts put in. Um, putting those crossings in on an existing road is pretty expensive and quite a bit of work. Um, but if we can do it and work with DOT and their planning when they are actually planning to redo a road already, it's kind of a drop in the bucket for them to do that. So um, this is, um, I like this project. This is actively going to help, pro to help us with DOT. Um, you know, we have one site near, um, one of the sites that we've, um, has been most publicly advertised, I think, from this is the Jordan Pond area um, near Stevens Point. There was a huge underpass that was put in there, um, partly from the information that we got um, from the survey. And I think it is probably, if you can see my pointer, this little red dot here. Um, so we um, are hoping to work with them more and more in the future once we get a lot of these areas identified. Uh, this is what the website looks like um, to submit your turtle sightings. Also some information on protecting nests if you're lucky enough to have a turtle laying eggs nesting on your property. Um, and then the, the website at the bottom um, is the direct link there, but you can also Google Wisconsin Turtle Conservation Program and that will take you right to the website as well. And that is it. Um, I'll leave it here in case anyone wants the website. Um, yeah, 